Ah, uh, I think we're ready this time. All right, here we go. It's flashing. All right, it's not recording yet, but it's. I think that tells me that it's, it's about. That we're ready to go. Okay, here we go. Okay, I guess we're already recording. Um, <coughs> Yeah, well, if we're not recording, then I'll just have to edit, or if we are recording, I'll just have to edit all this stuff out, so we'll just assume. Um, okay, if I'm not, then we may have to do it again. I'll do, I, I've got three other periods to work with us, so. Okay, uh, nature of gases. First of all, mind you, we've covered most of this on the last two days in class, so the, a lot of this conceptually is going to be reviewed for you guys, but these, this, these are the specifics that you guys need to know. Uh, first of all, air is a gas mixture. The air that we breathe is a gas mixture. Only 21% of it is actually oxygen. The rest of it is stuff that we don't need with the vast majority of it being nitrogen. We live in a nitrogen rich atmosphere. Okay, it, we breathe nitrogen all the time and it does nothing to us. It's a, it's a harmless gas to us. Okay, most gases are colorless and invisible, with a few exceptions. Okay. Most gases are colorless and invisible. Okay, uh, Cl2 tends to be yellow. Okay, this is why mustard gas, it was called mustard gas, because it had this, it was primarily chlorine gas and had this yellow tint to it. And so in the bottom of the trenches in World War One, if there was yellow in the bot and it looked kind of yellow at the bottom, you didn't go in there. Bad idea. Okay. Nitrogen dioxide is reddish brown. Okay. There are some other properties. Gases fill the container that they're placed in. Completely fill it. So if you have a closed container, it completely fills the closed container. Okay, as opposed to liquid, where liquid will take the shape of the container, gases will actually fill the whole thing. All right? Some gases exist as atoms, as single atoms. Which ones are those? Which gases exist as single atoms? Hmm. Yes, they are monatomic. Good. Helium would be one of them. What other ones are like helium? Xenon. What are those guys called? Those are the noble gases. Right. The noble gases. The noble gases exist as atoms. There are seven, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that exist as, not monatomic, Dominic, but they are diatomic. Those are a magnificent seven. Okay, those are, to recall, H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2. Right? Yeah, okay. Okay, and all the other gases are molecular compounds, like CH4, which is methane. <laughs> Methane's my favorite kind of gas. And if you've been anywhere near my desk this morning, you can tell why. Never mind, I'm being gross. Okay. <laughs> Actually, methane, uh, we've been through this. Methane is colorless and odorless. There is no smell to methane. Even though methane is generally what you smell coming out of uh, when you smell a gas leak, okay, it is detecting methane in general. Um, they put an odor material into natural gas lines so that you can, using your nose, detect, an, uh, detect a gas leak. Um, yeah, people and animals tend to put an odor, odorous substance in their gas leaks also. Okay, moving on. 
Okay, gas is... That's right, like dogs. Oh, good. Oh, oh. Okay, I got into my own tangent. Okay. Uh, gases are compressible. They're used in shock absorbers and airbags for cars. Okay. Gases diffuse. In other words, they can move through each other rapidly. Once again, this brings us back to the odorous emanations that certain animals release and how you can detect it soon after they are released. It's traveling through the other gases in the room and finding its way to your olfactory bulbs inside your nose. Okay. Uh, gases exert pressure on the walls of their containers. The pressure is equal to the force they exert divided by the area. The basic SI unit for force is called a Pascal. Yes, named for that Pascal, as in Blaise Pascal, the inventor of the Pascal's Triangle. Um, it is essentially the weight of a baseball spread across a coffee table. It's really not a whole lot. It's one Newton per meter squared. Uh, so our atmosphere is actually, it's about a hundred thousand Pascals. Alright. Um, so the pressure of a gas then depends on its temperature. In other words, the higher a temperature exerts, the higher temperatures exert greater pressures. Okay, this is Gay-Lussac's law. Again, probably the most unfortunately named scientist in the history of science. <laughs> we'll get to that dude later. Okay. Which brings us to the rules by which we study gases. We make some critical assumptions to how we study gases. Uh, you guys learned them on Friday for the Matter Dance, but we're, we're going to codify them now and actually put them down on paper. So, the first one, or this is called, collectively it is called, the Kinetic Molecular Theory, or the KMT. Okay, the gas properties are explained using this model. It was developed primarily by three different scientists, taking over a hundred years to develop, by Rudolf Clausius, James Clark Maxwell, and Ludwig Boltzmann. By the way, this dude right here, this uh, James Maxwell, he is not quite in the big three. We talked about the big three scientists of all time. He's not you know, Einstein, Aristotle, and, and Newton. He's not up there, but he's pretty darn close. This guy uh, discovered that electromagnet that magnets and electricity are really two versions of the same same force. And through this, he actually came up with a theor with a theoretical number for the speed of light. He proved that the speed of light was the, the how as fast as it was through his explorations, which was really a pretty cool, uh, uh, pretty cool discovery. Okay, these are the components of the KMT, and there's a whole bunch of writing you guys got to do here, so I'll give you guys some time. First, gases consist of tiny particles with mass. By the way, these are all going to be pretty common sense. Okay, it's putting them all together, but they, they actually have to be set down as rules. Okay. But they all kind of make sense when we think about what, what atoms really are. Okay, so gases consist of tiny particles with mass. Particles of gas are separated from each other by relatively large distances. Okay, this makes the volume of a gas. Okay, the volume of a gas particle itself, then, is considered negligible. Gas particles have virtually no size. 
or as some people like to put it, size doesn't matter. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. That's I got jokes. Laugh, darn it. Okay. So the particles of a gas are separated from each other by relatively large distances. The volume of a gas particle itself is considered negligible. Okay. Actually, I lied. Size does matter. They are really small. To the point where we can consider them zero. That they have no size. They have mass, but they have virtually no size. Alright. Now, gas particles are in constant random rapid motion. Uh, we did that one before, right? Okay, for example... This is how rapid they are. Hydrogen can travel at about one mile per second. That is quite fast. Collisions of gas particles with each other or the walls of a container are perfectly elastic. No energy is lost. And so right here, I want to pause for a second. I need to show you guys the happy and sad balls. So if you are watching this online, you're going to have to ask me, hey, Mr. Allen, what did you show everybody with the happy and sad balls? So we're going to pause here for a moment. Okay, so as per the demonstration... A perfectly elastic collision is a happy ball collision, and no kinetic energy is lost, and all the particles bounce off of each other, keeping all of the energy that they had when they started. So, then we have temperature, where temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the gas particles. Okay, kinetic energy is measured by the, by the equation 1 half mv squared. So that's the mass of the particle times the velocity squared of the particle. So if we're at a higher temperature, that means we have a higher kinetic energy. And if we have a lower temperature, we have a lower kinetic energy. Okay, so we can go to the next page. All right, gas particles. Oh, I haven't written it in there, so... That's too big. Where are we? Okay, gas particles. They exert no force on each other. No force. The attractive forces are negligible. Negligible means virtually nothing. Due to the rapid motion and the relatively large distance between particles. So in other words, there's no gravity attracting them. Um, if they are a polar gas, kind of rare. But if they're polar, they're not going to be attracted to each other using uh, using the hydrogen bonding or, or any kind of dipole-dipole uh, dipole attraction. They'll just rush right past each other because they're going so fast. Okay. Which brings us to measuring gases. Okay, there are four primary variables, primary variables, that can change. Then that's written twice. That can change, that can change. Uh, ignore, in fact, let's cover that up, because that's just ugly. So let's do that and that and that and cover that up and that, that's just I don't like that that's ugly 
Okay, there are four primary variables that can change the behavior of gases. They are uh, the amount of the gas. Okay, also number of, also known as the moles. Or N. We're going to see N as the variable for this. Okay, that's the amount of the gas. Okay, next one is volume. Okay, which will be V. Okay, then we will, uh, an example of this, and something you need to know for later on in your notes, 1 dm cubed equals 1 liter. 1 dm cubed equals 1 liter. But you've seen this before. Okay, you've seen this before. And we're going to pause again so we can go through this demonstration. Okay, so one decimeter, one cubic decimeter then equals one liter. No, I can't write anymore. I've got to type. Okay, T then. What do you guys think T is going to be? T is going to be temperature. Okay, in this particular case, temperature is going to be in Kelvin. It is the absolute temperature scale. The absolute temperature scale, which is Kelvin, must be used in all gas law problems. This is how you find it. 1 Kelvin equals your temperature in Celsius times 273.15 I said times didn't I that's plus oops I, I, I initially said times it is plus okay the other version okay check this out you ready okay the temperature in Kelvin equals the temperature in, let's see if I can find my degree symbol here. No, that's not it. That's not it. Uh, look for math, it's not there. Oh, no, I, I, I know it's that, but it's... There it is. Temperature in degrees Celsius, I'm sorry, Fahrenheit, my bad, Fahrenheit, is going to be 1.8 times, yes I can, pencil, okay, 1.8 times the degree Fahrenheit, okay, plus, get this, okay, hold on again, Plus, oh, I had it and I lost it. Hold on, it's I believe it is four fifty nine. Okay, so this will be your absolute temperature in Kelvin, 1.8 times your Fahrenheit temperature plus 459. Yes? What's that? The asterisk means multiply, yes. Okay. If you wish, I can do that. Okay. Okay. 
Multiply what? Multiply what? What I have typed here is correct. What I have typed here is correct. Okay. That is not a plus right there. This is a plus. It's just Kelvin plus 270. It's just Celsius plus 273. Okay. And last one is pressure. Okay, and pressure we go into in more in depth down here. Our atmosphere is made up of many gases. Oh, hold on. Let's get back to the red. Okay, our atmosphere is made of many gases. It is about 60 miles thick. Okay, the force of gravity from this gas exerts a pressure of one atmosphere at zero degrees Celsius on a clear day at sea level. Okay, so imagine the nicest day in Pismo or in Morro Bay or wherever you go. Beautiful, clear, okay, but cold. It is freezing outside, zero degrees Celsius. The air pressure will be one atmosphere. Ryan, question? We are above sea level. We're about 300 feet above sea level here in Fresno. Okay. Which, for all intents and purposes, is sea level. It's pretty close. Okay. It's like being on. It's being like on top of Morro Rock. Okay, you been Morro Bay? You ever seen Morro Bay? Okay. You ever seen the mountains near the coast? We have mountains near the coast. Be on top of a mountain. You're about as high as where Fresno is. Okay. Okay. What do we use to measure pressure? We use what's called a barometer. Okay, and this is the instrument used to measure atmospheric pressure. And we are going to have a demo right now. I'm going to try and demo this, and I'm going to have to stop the recording again. So.